Hi, everybody. How are you? Hi, everyone. I'm Brian. I'm Jerry. This is Jerry. Nice to meet you. Um, so I figured that we'd talk, uh, just do Q&A with me and Jerry for a bit, but feel free to jump in with questions anytime you want. And we'll talk for maybe about a half hour or so, and then we can do some questions at the end. You can talk about, uh, ask anything you want about, um, about Ultimate Ears, about uh, JH Audio, about audio technology, anything like that. So we'll cover it all from the beginning to, uh, to now. Cool. Ready to cool? go. Yeah, Ready and also make sure everyone gets a raffle ticket. We're giving away a set of Roxanne, so make sure you get your ticket in there for that at the end. Uh, yeah, and after, afterwards also for the whole day, we'll be demo, or Dr. Glick, who's in the back there, will be demoing um, all the models of JH so you can listen to them, and they, they all sound amazing, even if you're not a rock star. So please enjoy. So, um, so I thought we'd start by um, uh, just talking about how this story begins. So you're a guy who um, wasn't a musician and had no connections to this business and somehow got wrapped up with a bunch of guys from Van Halen and Sammy Hagar and sort of got you sort of mixed into this business. And maybe just talk about how that started and how you went from a guy who just likes music to a guy who became um, indispensable to these guys. Uh, yeah, when I was a kid, uh, I met a guy named Roger Moore, and he had a little local band. I was uh, teaching karate to him, right, as a little as a side thing so I could have my free lessons. But anyway... He, uh, he had this band, and I wanted to get into the, to the bar. I was underage, so I thought if I could move gear in that I could get into the bar without having to have an ID. So that's kind of how it started. Uh, and then I learned, you know, I learned to mix kind of by trial and error. I was really bad for the first few years, and people were not shy to tell me that. But uh, so anyway, um, I was mixing, and I had a couple mentors, and I started to get fairly, you know, uh, get pretty good at it and uh, I was driving down the road and it's kind of weird that Van Halen just kind of intertwined in my life just out of the blue I was driving down the road I was uh, had a red Trans Am I was like 1980 right and uh, I get pulled over and this guy was a promoter rep for contemporary productions he says hey Sammy Hagar's playing uh, Bush Stadium on Saturday and we need to drive him to drive your car out onto stage because he's got a song called Trans Am right so I was like, all right, whatever, you know, I want to get into the show, so I'll go down Sounds there. Sounds legit. So, yeah. yeah, so he showed me his card, so I was like, yeah, I'll show up. So I showed up, they, they let me in, and they go, well, we're going to introduce you to Sammy Hagar. I was like, all right, great, you know, and uh, so I walk up, and uh, I go, hi, I'm Jerry. He goes, hi, I'm Sammy, and uh, basically kind of dismissed me a little bit. Hey, thanks for letting me use your car, and I'll get out of here, kid, you know. So, uh, so he drives it out on the stage, and it kind of became like a little bit of an urban legend in St. Louis, right? But um uh, so that was kind of my first introduction, and I, was, I saw the Big Rock show, and I saw, you know, I was, realized that if I got really good at mixing, maybe I could get to that level someday. So fast forward to, like, 1984. I'm sitting in, and uh, kind of got discouraged. Uh, I'll keep this short if I can. And uh, I was going to just start doing a normal day gig because the bands weren't paying any money. I was starving to death, and I went and saw the Van Halen 1984 show. They, they played two nights, so... At the end of the show, I was just blown away. I was like, I think I want to do sound engineering again. And uh, so I'm sitting at this little bar called bar Bogart's on the landing on the riverfront. And I look to my left, and David Lee Ross sits down right next to me, right? And I was like, wow. You know, so we sit down, and uh, I start talking to him about how, you know, martial arts and stretching. I never even said a word to him about, about rock and roll, even though I wanted to go. Yeah, I knew who he was. Absolutely. <laughs> I just saw him on stage. I actually wanted to ask him for a job, but I didn't, right? But so... 18 months later, I'm actually working for him because I met a gentleman that was a drum tech uh, for him, and uh, he was with the Beach Boys. And when Dave left Van Halen, uh, he introduced me to the Dave camp, and I ended up 18 months later working for Dave. So it's kind of a weird, a weird thing, right? So this is like eight, 1986 or so, for the Eat Him and Smile tour and, Sky, um, and um, Skyscraper. And then in 95, I start working for Van Halen, right? So I'm working for Dave. I'm working for Van Halen. Neither know that I'm working for the other because I didn't want to get fired. So, you know, so that's kind of how it kind of just intertwined. And then in 95, when I was working for Van Halen, we decided to put Alex on in ears. And that's kind of how Ultimate Ears started. So basically, so, the, so I hear the story is that, so Alex and Eddie came to you and said, we're basically going deaf. What do we do, right? Yeah, well, it and was... what happens. It was, well, Alex was was going deaf because he had Eddie's guitar cabinet blaring behind him. He had these two big PA systems uh, behind him. So he's had, you know, he was just getting killed with uh, volume. And it sounded really bad out front because all this stuff is going through the drum mics. And uh, 
So in-ear monitors, it was in its infancy, and uh, people were focusing more on the transmitters and receivers than they were the earphone side of it. So uh, they wanted to, to save the rest of Alex's hearing, so we decided to try to put him on in-ear monitors. Well, it didn't go so well because he's, you know, even though he had had some, you know, he'd been around loud music, the guy's got an amazing ear, and he can hear tonality and everything else. So as soon as there was two companies back then that, that in the uh, beginning had started putting basically either a balanced armature uh, in a silicone mold or a, basically a Sony diaphragm in a mold and called them, you know, in-ear monitors. Um, so we, we get him a set of each, and he listens to the first set, plays about four, four beats, takes them out, throws them down, puts a second set in, plays about four beats, and goes, these things sound horrible. He goes, you know, I suggest we find something better. And I said, well, they don't make anything better. And he goes, well, maybe you should figure out how to make something better. Then he gets up and walks off his drum kit. So that's kind of how I started down the path. I never <laughs> It all comes back wanted, to Ben Hill. Yeah, I didn't want to build anything. I never thought about it, but it was just, I was kind of instructed, you know, to do it. And I wanted to keep my gig. So, you know, I <laughs> decided I was going to build something that sounded better. So the uh, so um, so I think the story is that so there was nothing that was better. So you had to figure out how to make something. So you use parts from we can describe. But you use parts from like a pacemaker and parts from a hearing aid, and somehow jury rigged this stuff up to work. It was somehow better than everything else out there, which is amazing. Well, I I realized you know by starting to experiment with uh, the components that one component couldn't do the complete frequency response from lows to high. You could have with the balanced armature, it was kind of a hearing aid driver, basically a hot rodded hearing aid speaker. You could get uh, you could get good lows, not lows, but low mids, mids and highs, but no real sub bass. And then with the the diaphragm speaker that's in a Sony bud, you get nice lows, but you couldn't get any top end extension. So I realized that you know looking up at the PA system, it wasn't rocket science. I was like, well, you know, we've been putting multiple you know lows, mids and highs with crossovers in big big speakers. Why can't we do it in a miniature earphone? So. I started just researching and trying to find miniature components and uh, landed a gentleman named Rick Zanardo at a company called Knowles, became my liaison, and uh, he was sending me samples. I would put them on the analyzer with, it was modeling clay and an analyzer mic and, you know, shoot pink noise through it and see what the frequency response was. So I found a driver that was suitable for mids and highs, but I couldn't find a driver that had the capacity for live performance for low frequency uh, uh, reproduction. So I get a call from Rick. He goes, hey, I, I found this thing in the armature, uh, armature cemetery. He goes, it's a pacemaker uh, speaker. He goes, what it's for is if, uh, if someone has a pacemaker, it has to emit a 140 dB tone or 130 dB tone through their chest to let them know that they're going to get a zap so they <laughs> might want to sit down, right? So I was like, cool, send it to me. So I shoot pink noise through it, you know, and all of a sudden I'm like, wow, this thing's a perfect bass driver, right? So then I <laughs> made a little crossover and popped him into Alex's ears. He smiled and I was like, wow, you know, so that's kind of how that just, you know, it was just trial and error and, you know, a lucky call from Rick and, and that's kind of how it all came together. And that was the first UE5, the uh, first two-way in-air monitor. So, um, so I guess the next question is, so how do you go from a guy who has sort of thrown this together from the graveyard of hearing aid parts um, to someone who all the, the rock stars are coming and begging for products. So they say that um, Sebastian Bach came begging you with cash. He said, give me as many as you can. And Engelbert Hunkbrink, and, and everyone's coming and begging. So what do you do? So you, you have to mass produce these. What happens? Well, it was kind of funny. Um, Skid Row was open for Van Halen. They saw Alex was happy, and they had the other models, and they weren't happy. So I built them uh, six sets of in-ear monitors. They asked me if I could do it. I go, yeah, I'll, I'll build you six sets. And I'd never sold anything. It wasn't a company. And... Uh, I walk into the production office and the tour manager goes, well, how much do I owe you? I was like, well, $500 a pair. So he hands me three grand, right? And I was like, this is like three weeks work. You know, I was like, this is a lot more profitable than actually mixing for a living. So that's when I decided to do Ultimate Ears. But what happened was West Tone was my, was the company that did the shells for me because I had no concept of how to mold it, but I was, I did all the audio circuits. So, um, so, you know, there's a couple of good guys at West Tone that I became very good friends with, Carl and Chris Cartwright. And so um, I told them, I said, I'm going to start a company. Will you guys be my OEM? And they're like, yeah, we'll build them for you. So um, I basically became the design and the marketing uh, side of Ultimate Ears. And then they were my OEM. They would do the manufacturing for me. So that's how we kept up with production is I had to outsource it because I didn't have the capability to do any of the molding or anything.
And so uh, at some point then you decide to split with Westone and start manufacturing on your own. So again, so when you're in a situation as a small business owner where all of a sudden you... Oh, am I, am I suck in here? Two, two? Okay, sorry. Where all of a sudden you can't interrupt your business, but you have to start doing things you haven't done before. So how do you just out of nowhere learn to manufacture the shells as well um, without interrupting your business? Well, as, uh, what I did is I, um, I can... I, we were having a kind of a little divorce situation going on between Weston and myself, and the president told me, you know, we can't really divorce because you don't know how to build the product, so, you know, you're going to just kind of have to toe the line in and do this. So I decided to go to Florida and learn how to build hearing aids, and I went to a place called Electone, and I stayed there for two weeks trying to learn how to build shells and to do hearing aid fabrication, uh, and realized that I was not going to be able to get the skill set within two weeks to, to start my own lab. So I hired the instructor and I uh, said, you know, hey, if I double your salary, will you come to Vegas and start a lab with me? And he said, yeah, no problem. So he shows up. I bought all this equipment and uh, he's like, you bought all the stuff that's wrong, you know? So I was like, <laughs> great. He's, and I had a little light to make shells. It was about six inches by six inches and he called it the Barbie tanning bed. He goes, I can't make your pieces with Barbie tanning bed. So so we revamped, and we continued to let Westone manufacture, and the, we, um, we basically developed the process that now is kind of what all of the uh, companies are doing as far as the ultraviolet cure shells, you know, so we figured it out. We built the first hundred, you know, we decided, okay, now we're ready to go, so I uh, started building all the stuff in-house. So the first hundred pair I built, um, I rebuilt them maybe four times, and my customers were really you know, cool, because I was telling them, well, I'm trying to learn how to build this. They would fail, and they'd send them back. So, But within about 90 days, we had the process down, and, and uh, everybody supported us out in the pro market. So, you know, that's how Ultimate Ears, uh, you know, that's how my manufacturing side got started, out of necessity. And so as... as um <clears throat> So during this whole process, you're still mixing for bands. So so you've been you were mixing for uh, for Kiss and for all these bands. And I've heard some interesting stories about uh, one of them that I read was about um, how you said some interesting shouting matches with Gene Simmons, where he thought he was shouting at you, but it turns out you may not have been there. Yeah, and Gene's defense, the equipment back then was not really good, and maybe I wasn't didn't have the chops either. But he, um, you know, we had some monumental historic, you know, squabbles back and forth, kind of like a husband and wife. But uh, I would. We were in a truck stop one night, and I look over, and there's this uh, cardboard cutout full size of a Big Daddy Don Garlis. He's holding a Kindle oil can, right? So I, was, so I said, I'm going to steal that. So I stole it. I took it. And I put it on the bus. And from that point on, I put a Kiss T-shirt on it, and then I, I put a bunch of scruff on it because I was so miserable on that tour that I wouldn't shave. So I kind of made it look like me. I put a Kiss hat on it. And we always had this, this scrim in front of us. It was like a black mesh scrim, but I had to have a a light on my face so Gene could see my face when he was, you know, um, as you could say, maybe talking to me. Um, but uh, so every time I would get upset with Gene, I would tell my third man, give me Big Daddy. So what I would do is I would take the cardboard cutout and I'd put it behind the mixing console and I'd walk off and take a breather and not be mad anymore. And when I'd cool down, I'd come back. Well, that might be four or five songs. And then Gene would come over and start yelling at the cardboard cutout. And everybody on stage knew about it, but he didn't, right? So, so it got to be kind of a running joke, and we had to put him up there more than... Actually, I think that the cardboard cutout probably made more money than I did on that tour after that, you know? <laughs> so that's kind of the Big Daddy story. Um, cool. So, um, so I want to talk a bit about, uh, but, um, about, uh, about JH, but uh, before that, I want to talk about how um, you realize, okay, well, you're selling these really high-end units to rock stars that cost a lot of money. They're very highly customized. At some point, you realize that everyone's running around listening to really bad earphones, and there's an opportunity there for a consumer, too. So I want to talk about what, um, what it takes for someone who's used to making you know, $1,000 units, $2,000 units. What do you do when you decide, OK, I want to make things for a market that can't afford to spend more than $100 or $200, and, uh, and how that happens, how you become a company that's split between pro, um, pro and sort of the lower end consumer? Um, uh, you know, obviously, that change came about with the iPod, because before the iPod, uh, people would buy sixty, hundred dollar CD players, and no one wanted to spend more than fifty dollars for a set of Sony buds. Uh, Two thousand and three, um, I was mixing uh, the Lincoln Park guys, and the production assistant walks up and hands me an iPod. I was like, "What is this thing?" You know, and so she explains that there's a bunch of songs on it. And I put my earpieces in and I listen. I go, "You know, it's pretty good, pretty good fit. The earpieces sound good with the, with the player." So I quit the tour, came back 
um, because the lab's going, so I'm still touring with bands and stuff. So I, I quit the tour to come back and start like a consumer division. And, and um, it was an interesting experience because this, these forums that just started like Head Fi and all of that and um, went out and uh, spoke to Apple at the time because they were iPod and they gave us some, some support. But uh, we actually grew, um, I think in three years, we grew 1,000% just off of the consumers. So I ended up having to build a, a lower cost unit that the consumers would buy. And what's kind of crazy now is it's shifted. The consumers are more interested in the high-end stuff, especially for, you know Southeast Asian people that really appreciate the, the audio quality. So, you know, in the beginning, we, we thought we had to really build these low-cost low earpieces. And, and now today, everybody's used to buying, you know, more top-shelf stuff than the, than, the, uh, than the more reasonably priced stuff. And is the technology moving down from the really high-end? Is it getting cheaper to manufacture so you can put really high-end equipment? Or are the costs pretty much staying the same? The, the costs are staying the same because the, the, the companies that build the, the components are they know they have a monopoly, even though, you know, I have them designed, I design them and I have them built to my specs, they still know they're the only game in town. There's only a couple, two companies that build the components. So they've kept the cost of the components high. So it's really kind of hard to, to get anything really, really cheap. You know, I don't think you'll ever see a a hundred dollar multi-driver earpiece until they decide they want to increase volume versus profit margin. And so that was sort of the next question. So, so how is it that, that the two companies that you found at JH and Ultimate Ears are the companies that everyone goes to? Why is nobody else able to break into this market? Is it because of you? And because the components are just, you've locked up the market? Or why, why can no one else compete here? Well, I'd like to say it was me, but I think, <laughs> it, but no, it's not. Um, Ultimate Ears is just a brand that's been around since 1995, so people know the brand. Um, all of the components that I use inside my, my uh, earphones are built to my specs, so they're not uh, off-the-shelf components. They may have the same can size as what uh, anybody can buy and put into a shell, but they're all to my spec, my impedance curves. So I think that Ultimate Ears, when I was there, and Jerry Harvey Audio now, I think it's more of the audio signature and, uh, and performance that keeps people coming back to us. Uh, it's really easy to now to learn how to build a mold and put a bunch of components in it but it's getting those components tuned and to in phase and to, to play correctly with each other that actually, um, you know, the end result is is better if you know what you're doing. I'm not saying that I'm not the only per, the only person who knows that, but I think the end user when they compare, you know, A, B, C, and D when they listen, they can actually hear uh, kind of the audio signature that that I think is pleasing to to most people. So let's then talk about um, about JH Audio then. So. So you sell Ultimate Ears, and you decide to start out on your own again. And so what's different this time? So you're, again, starting out from zero, and you have this big user base. And uh, I didn't sell Ultimate yeah. Ears. I kind of was on the, the backside of that. Okay. Um, watch Venture Capital, and I'll leave it at that. But uh, <laughs> so we started uh, Jerry Harvey Audio, JH Audio, and I had a little bit of a break period because I had a non-compete. Um, but I wasn't done designing uh, the earphones, I wanted to, I had designs I'd been working on for, you know, that two year period that I wanted to get out into the marketplace. So for me, uh, JH Audio is just a continuation of Ultimate Ears and uh, just gives me a platform to keep designing products and trying to push the technology forward. And so what are you doing differently now? So, so you've been in this business for a long time and so you're releasing things like Roxanne, which no one's ever seen before. So what, what's everyone else doing? Are they seeing this and, and what's happening? Uh, I'm not sure what the competition's doing, but I just keep finding new ways to improve the technology, like um, things that are very obvious that I overlooked for 15 years, uh, time and phase. I mean, you have to make sure that everything's in time and phase in order to have a, a proper phase curve. And the, the Roxanne, I was, when I was working on the Roxanne, I discovered that if I could put everything in time, the low, mid, and highs within a hundredth of a millisecond, that I had a perfectly flat phase response, which was... Um, is what gives you the the imaging, you know, especially in the center image where there's no interaction. Any phase cancellation is going to take care, take place where the center image works. But so I think the biggest thing, um, there's two things that I believe that have set Jerry Harvey Audio apart from everyone else is time phase, making sure everything's in correct time and phase, and then figuring out how to get the top end extension out of a balanced armature earpiece. Um, it's really easy to get lows, mids. Getting any top end extension above, you know, 10K is the difficult part because of 
how balanced armatures work. All right, so that's a good lead-in, I guess, for the next sort of set of questions. I'm curious about uh, your thoughts on on modern audio engineering. So lots of people here listen to Spotify or Google uh, Google Music, things like this, um, and these are all compressed. So what does this do for you as a designer um, when you have to make products that people are using to listen to uh, compressed audio that may not um, that may be very different from what the pros are listening to? Um, I don't. I would never design a product that sounded good with low quality audio. So my basic concept for designing an audio product is to make it straight through plumbing um, that you should get out of it exactly what you put into it with varying degrees of bass response because you know bass is like spice some people like bland food some people like spicy food so no one ever tells me you know I really don't want you know I want to I don't want an accurate uh, frequency response but they always ask me how much bass does an earpiece have in it so um, so my concept is to make an earpiece that every time you make the audio signal better that the earpiece reproduces uh, will ramp up with with the higher quality audio signal with nowadays you have you know these high resolution players like the uh, Stell Kern players that are doing 192 files they're doing uh, DSD with dual DAX and killer headphone amps so those players really shine with a, a good set of headphones or a good set of earpieces and I will say that when you do have a, a, a really good set of headphones or earphones when you play a low res file, you hear a low res file. So, you know, I, I, I would never design anything to try to, to polish that up. It sort of reminds me when CDs first came out, when they said there's a warning on a CD that says, warning, this may reveal weaknesses in the original recording because this is digital and it was recorded really poorly 10 years ago. Um, I, I think that that's the beauty of the recordings, though. Some of those old analog recordings, even when you hear them remastered, you know, they still sound, they sound analog and they sound amazing i think listening to an old recording th that's been remastered is is still pretty cool um you know listen to some of the songs in the 60s i mean they had such good melodies and such good hooks i mean you were listening to it you know on an am radio that had m limited frequency response but the song still rocked either it was a good song or it wasn't so that's you know i just i appreciate the old recordings and i think that hearing it the way it was recorded back then but prop you know and high res is really cool. So I guess the last one is, um, is so JH traditionally is making professional um, IEMs, but the consumer market is enormous. So, so how, do you, how do you market into that market? How do you break into that? How do you convince people who think that the, the uh, iPod earphones that they get, um, how do you convince people there's something better? Um, well, I think because of Google and because of um, the way that the world works now, that especially the internet, anybody that just puts in a better headphone is going to end up to one of the chat rooms, you know, the headfi dot, dot, I don't know, dot org or something like that. So I think that people do their research, and by doing their research, they kind of stumble upon me, our right. ultimate ears or one of the companies. And so also, so you mentioned that you're, um, that the, all the high-end products that um, the JH makes are all custom fit, except for the Roxanne, which you mentioned has a, um, has a universal fit as well. So is the movement for consumer towards uh, universal fit, I assume, because it's easier to sell, right? Uh, people want instant gratification, but I think they also want higher quality audio out of the one size fits all. The trend in Southeast Asia, which hasn't quite hit America yet, is that there's a comp uh, few companies that were building uh, high end uh, one size fits all. They were also custom companies, but uh, so the audio quality was increasing. It wasn't you know the two hundred or three hundred dollar. Uh, mass produced out of China earphones. They're selling things for, you know, Sure just put out a new product, the 846, which is a good product for $1,200. And a company called Fitty or a Japanese company has a product that's 1500 That's one size fits all. It's not even custom. Um, so when I saw that trend, uh, for me, you know, I always want to one up everyone else in the marketplace. So I took my new product, Roxanne, and just made a universal fit out of it so I could kind of like one up everyone. And it's amazing. Um, you know, it's an expensive product, but we can't build it fast enough in, in the one size fits all. So it's, I think that anybody that appreciates audio um, and they, if they get what they pay for is looking for, if they want a good product that is it's available now before that, that option wasn't available. And are you selling um, the universal fits in stores or are they still only sold through uh, directly? Uh, the universal fits are only sold through our dealers. So like Julie is one of our dealers in New York. She sells them. And then uh, we have dealers all across the all across the country. There, uh, we'll have like earphone, um, I think earphone solutions. There's there's a couple other companies out there that will start selling them here pretty soon. But 
So those aren't sold direct at the present time. They're all sold through our through our dealers, and they'll be listed on the website shortly. So we anyone just have, launched it. Does anyone have any questions about audio engineering, about rock stars, about anything? So please come to the mic if you want to talk. Hey, uh, thanks for coming today. I have a oh, set of uh, triple five tens there. Oh, Amazing. cool. Um, <laughs> But uh, I was just curious about uh, the trend that music is taking now with, uh, I guess, recorded music becoming more compressed in general um, and how you're taking that into account with how you design headphones where you have like an even response in your in your earpieces, but uh, the music itself may not be up to par for that, for what people are starting to listen to. So I was just curious how you're handling that. Um, well, I think uh, I'll touch on it. It's like I just... I don't change the way I build a product or tune a product for the lower compressed files. But I do think that what's happening is that people are becoming more aware of the high resolution files out on the internet. Like you have uh, hdtracks.net, you have about a half dozen, um, uh, half dozen websites out there that you can actually download pretty much any album that you've ever loved in 192 that's been remastered or not remastered, but at least 96K. So I think the trend, obviously, anybody that's listening to very compressed music is not an audiophile. They, they probably would be okay with a normal set of headphones. Sorry, but, I guess my question is more how the bands themselves are recording. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's kind of crazy. I mean, you, you listen to some of, these, some of these records that are mastered. They're, they're mastered, so they sound really loud. So uh, that's just a preference of whoever whoever the uh, the mix engineer is, whoever's doing the, the mastering. But I hope that that trend of making things compressed and sounding, you know, really kind of loud, kind of like the, well, I won't mention any bands, but uh, um, that that trend actually, you know, reverses and people are trying to get a more, you know, analog sound out of it instead of that highly compressed sound. So that's what I, I mean, I'm not a recording engineer. I'm a live sound engineer, so... I'm not really in tune with the recording process of, of what they're doing in the studios these days. That's actually an interesting follow-up I had. So, 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 you, so you control, so you're mixing what the band is hearing on stage, and there's a guy in the audience who's mixing what the audience is hearing. So what are the differences, um, like, what are the differences in, in how you mix for the band versus how they mix for the audience? Well, I have to make the band happy. So it's, it's kind of like Burger King, have it your way. It's like a service industry. I may not, uh, I may, I would, there's a lot of people I've worked for that I would never... Uh, get that sound on my own that they like to listen to while they're performing. So I basically interact with the band and I please the band. And the front of house engineer, you know, has to please the guitar player's girlfriend. He has to please the manager. You know, so it's a totally different concept out front. It's it's more uh, it's more uh, you're judged by a lot of other people and reviews in the newspaper. And you know, uh, uh, for me, I get an instant review from the band, either they like it or I don't. So it's kind of less pressure than being the guy out front that's totally under the microscope. Well, is it common for the bands to want to listen though to what the audience is hearing so they know what they're experiencing? Well, it's really funny what they do. They always get a board tape at the end of the night. Now they have basically Pro Tools, so they can kind of do a quick mix. Uh, but the funny thing is, is now that the last Van Halen tour I did, Alex would come in with a cell phone and a YouTube clip and go, listen to what this sounds like. And we're like, well, he, we don't even know what part of the building that guy was sitting in, right? So so it's, you know, um, so some people, you know, want to listen to the YouTube stuff and try to make it sound like Alex wants it to sound good and translate to that, you know, that AM radio sounding cell phone. And then, you know, other bands are just want to hear it, you know, a full mix down of of, you know, multi-track that's, that's gone down to, to a CD at the end of the night so they can review if they're performing right or what it sounds like. But the only thing that you hear if you're a musician, unless you're going out in front of the PA, is you're, all you're hearing is a, is a bunch of slap off the back wall and low, low end coming off the PA. So you really have no idea what it sounds like in the front of house. You just have to trust the people that are out in front that are your people to give you a straight story of what it sounds like, right? Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for coming in and talking to us. Uh, I was, I'm sure there's a lot of engineers in the room. I was wondering if you could talk through some of the technical considerations you make in terms of designing your headphones. Uh, so I'm thinking about how you choose your crossovers. Is a flat frequency response, you know, the ideal response? How you deal with phase issues if you have two bass drivers, for example? Um, so if you could just talk through those a little bit. Sure. Um, first of all, I would never tune anything flat. I think flat's boring. Uh, 
kick drum shouldn't sound like a baseball hitting a mid, right? So, um, but that's my personal preference. So I always tune things with a little bit more bottom end. But as far as, um, like I said, when you're using multi, I'll just speak to the phase first. When you're using multi driver components, they all have different time signatures. Uh, just like a PA system, the low frequencies are longer sound waves and high frequencies are much shorter. So in a PA system, the you know, if you look at it without any time correction, the highs are going to be early, the mids are going to be a little bit later, and the lows are going to be really slow. So what you do in, you know, nowadays you don't have to do it, but what the DSP's done is they've basically delayed the mids, delayed the highs, so everything arrives at the same time, right? And then they put it in time with the subs. So that's kind of what we've I've done in the earpiece, but I've done a physical waveguide. So I discovered that you know, we've got better software now because of the power of the PC. I can test, you know, phase curves and I can get within a hundredth of a millisecond on the impulse time of those little miniature drivers. So I found that as soon as I went within a hundredth of a millisecond, that the crossover points became perfect where I actually had to change my crossover shapes because they became so efficient at the crossover points and that the phase response basically became uh, not perfectly flat, but no more than 10 degrees off of zero, which is unheard of in an in-ear monitor because um, they're pretty much up until that point we're all out of phase you know at either the crossover point or some of the old drivers were just out of phase across the bandwidth just internally right um, so that's the phase side of it the other th big obstacle as I mentioned earlier is high frequency response so when I design like this new piece the Roxanne uh, when I first the first in-ear monitor I, I designed I got it to the high frequency extension rolled off at 8K, and there was no way that we could get it to, to, to go out any further. And that's because the way that a balanced armature impedance curve works. So, what happens is as a, it goes up in frequency, the impedance rises. So, you know, you may have 10 ohms at, at, one, at 1K, and you'll have 100 ohms at, at 20K. So, what happens is the headphone amp doesn't see a load, and the Top, the high end roll off is inverse to the, the rise in the impedance curve. So it looks like a hockey stick and it does the same thing. What I found is that if I can change the shape of the impedance curve, that I can actually get more high frequency extension. So I designed the, the reason I use four drivers on the, on the Roxanne is because I could actually uh, tune those coils. You know, if you, if you do DC from, you know, from 10 hertz to 20K, the thing will measure a half ohm. But as soon as you high pass it out to 4K, it, it measures, you know, 20 ohms, right? Right there. So what I ended up doing was by having four components, I could wire them all in parallel, high pass them, and have the, the headphone amp see a load at 20K, which is why the Roxanne's the first earpiece I've ever got that will go out past 20K before and still have usable information, you know, not down 12 or 14 dB or something like that. So that's the biggest um, time. And then as far as the audio uh, response, I never tune anything flat. I tune it accurate. So if you were to see it on an FFT analyzer, you get out of it exactly what you put into it. I kind of shape the top end roll off where I think it's pleasing. And then I set the bass response. So like the new piece, um, like I said, every day I answer the question, how much bass does a particular model have? So with the new piece I designed, I, I, set, I put attenuators on the bass driver so you can set it 0 to plus 15. So you can basically set the bass where you like it. So kind of stopped, you know, preempted the conversation there. So did that answer any of your questions? Okay. Hi, uh, I'm actually a live engineer, so I've got a question sort of from that side of the fence. Okay. Um, in terms of modern front of house systems and even, you know, dynamic driver uh, monitor systems these days, DSP, like you sort of mentioned, is a really big thing. So uh, do you see that sort of coming to the in-ear market in terms of things like customizability, so the bass response, the high end response, whatever, changing it to sort of that person's taste, even in the consumer market where you don't have a monitor guy to sort of, you know, boost your top end or whatever? Uh, I, I see that coming in the near future. Um, I built a, a three-way uh, amplifier a couple years ago called the 3A, so it didn't give the user the interface that I wanted it to because, um, you know, it's, it was three amps in there, but I do believe that DSP equalization and control of the circuit for an end user is is really close. I think the the bottom end uh, control on the on the rocks and is just the starting point. So what's going to um, 
if you look at that earpiece, I actually took the the passive crossover circuit. There's four pins at the earpiece, so you have ground, low, mid, and high. So my idea is that you could actually put an attenuator on any band and just do a broad low, mid, and high adjustment if you liked. I'm kind of doing an open market to the to the cable manufacturers aftermarket. Um, and also, I think that the only way that we're going to get any more out of an in-ear monitor with the current technology is going to be control-based. So um, that's been on my roadmap for quite a while. But what I think that really needs to happen is um, I think that giving the end user the control over being able to set the shape of the equalization, turn the, the to kind of mess around with the crossover. You know, I mean, that's what I would like. You know, so some people that may be above their skill set, it might need to be a little simpler. But I think at the end of the day, that that's not too far off. Great, thank you. That's You're awesome. Welcome. Is that control the kind of thing that you think will move into your other models? So you think that other besides the rock sand will let you adjust the uh, uh, the base and so on? Yeah, I think that that's going to be a, an ongoing. Uh, trend and just giving the end user more control over the the audios the the audio signature i guess it's interesting also for the consumer market so some people like listening to rap some people listen to rock and they're they have different opinions of how much bass there should be and how much treble there should be um, yeah so that's that's why i kind of set the the rocks in that way so if you want heavy bass <coughs> it'll shake your fillings out if you want flat you know who needs fillings flat. yeah who needs fillings yeah. um, any other questions overrated cool Thanks, guys. Appreciate Thanks it. Again, Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for coming.